I mean in the discharge of the edacto, overboard. Yeah. How there, the sample is taken there. Yeah. And then another question for Bal. Ah. Is this permitted? Uh, my name is uh, Stelios Ingridis from Lloyd Register. Uh, I have the perception that uh, it is required the sample point to be immediately before the uh, output valve. You are absolutely correct, but the fact that the rules state that it means, doesn't mean that the rules are correct. Okay. We what, we mean, what we mean at this point is that the rules exist for the purpose of giving us guidance, but we have to provide with a pragmatic solution as to where the sampling point has to be. Uh, if we were to consider, as I said, in the case of a UV system, the, the mixing between the driving water and the street water, unfortunately this will in no means give us the possibility of compliance. So I think it's just a matter of uh, using our brains a little bit beyond what the rules tell us. It's the IMO rules, yeah? Okay, thank you. So if I understood properly, you mean for this operation, you cannot guarantee compliance with the limits set by the rule? No, this, I, we, have, we can guarantee compliance. It's the point where you actually test the effect of the, of the treatment. But the effect of the treatment will be tested before having the effluent output. It cannot be, because you're actually mixing water which is untreated. And therefore it is not appropriate, it's not appropriate to mix local water which is untreated with treated water that comes out of the ballast tanks. If you have the UV system on the other hand, it could be treating on uptake the water that drives the inductor, the driving medium, and you bring it together with the treated water from the tank going through the UV reactor and you sample downstream of the reactor at the point before discharge. Because the requirement is for a double treatment for UV on uptake and discharge. But if you have ozone, for instance, you cannot inject ozone in the discharge site. If this has been tested 
to be proven to work, I see no reason why not. It's an issue of what has been tested and certified. Okay, clear. The next question about the uh, balance water team as well from uh, Mr. Mamalakis. Emo type approval certificate requirements unfortunately do not include class rule requirements, especially those related to electrical equipment. How balance water team manufacturer proactively cover this issue? Um, I have to partially agree with the observation. In reality, the IMO rule, the convention G8 specifically under part three, has got a very clear inclusion for environmental testing of the electrical equipment and control equipment. Consequently, at least from the point of view of environmental testing, which is power fluctuations, vibrations, variations in temperature and humidity are already covered. The other elements with regards to, let's say, the electrical design per se, have to be covered by other regulations like the IEC standards for the design of equipment for installation on board ship. Consequently, as I mentioned in my presentation earlier on, it is important to engage the services of credible suppliers, people that know what equipment should be going on board ship. Thank you. Uh, on this uh, type approval certificate and on the sampling procedure, we have to say that this is something still pending, it's not uh, clarified in, uh, in IMO. The sampling procedure under guideline G2 is already available. There has been a contention within the MEPC and, of course, by various flag states as to the actual value of the sampling procedure as it currently exists in writing. Uh, so I will agree with you that it is uh, a point rather unresolved, but the MEPC at the moment, as far as I am aware, they're working in trying to attain a final rule. Uh, this has been very heavily driven by the European Maritime Safety Agency based in Lisbon as well. Then uh, again a question for you by Daria Sabas from Besiktas. And the question is, what is the additional energy needed to run your equipment on board a Panama Balcarier, a Panamax Balcarier? Um, I cannot really tell you because, as I am not a shipbuilder, I cannot tell you what the Panama Bulk Carry capacity might be. But let's assume that it is a thousand cubic meters an hour per pump. Yeah. Uh, multiply that by three or four if your capacities are higher. I would say that for the electrochlorination system, we are talking just under a hundred kilowatts for a thousand cubic meters, and uh, um, less than 94 kilowatts for the UV treatment per thousand cubic meters capacity. What we have to remember, however, is that when we consider the effect of UV, you have to utilize the UV equipment twice, in other words, on up, on up uh, take and discharge. Therefore, you have to multiply your overall ex OPEX by a factor of two. Shall we continue asking the makers? You have a question, you said? Okay, I, 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 I have a question uh, for Mr. Uh, uh, Jefferson uh, on the tier three uh, regulation. And did I understand right from, uh, yeah, did I understand right from your presentation that the consumption uh, will be, of, of your proposed solution will be less uh, than the consumption uh, of a tier two system? Because I was always under the impression that to comply with Tier 3, we increase the consumption and we increase the CO2. It's one of those regulations that to reduce NOx, you increase CO2, and so forth. Yes, um, the Tier 3 compliance uh, does have a fuel penalty of what it shows here, 1, 2, 3 grams. Uh, for this engine, we have identified the possibility of optimizing uh, the engine, fuel optimizing the engine, uh, having a greater NOx penalty, but as we have the EGR system, then we can, uh, in the tier two mode, we can implement a uh, running mode with a part uh, or a lower ratio EGR at the same time running the, the fuel optimized engine. 
But we need to gather some more service experience in order to do this. So this is just the indication that is, is shown right now. But there is, there's definitely a, a great potential. Okay. Then my question about scrubbers. Um, I, I wouldn't have a problem installing scrubbers on my ship if I only knew one thing, that heavy fuel oil will be available for me to burn. Because the way it goes now, I might have no choice. And if, if the whole industry changes to uh, MDO and gas oil, then if there isn't any heavy oil available, then it doesn't make economic sense to have a scrubber. Um, that's a big unknown to me. How, how would you reply to that? You know, <clears throat> first of all, that the refineries is saying that to actually rebuild uh, heavy fuel oil into uh, distillate, that's a no option. Because what you then are doing is you just spoil champagne, mixing it with beer, namely hydrogen, to build up the relation between hydrogen and carbon. So, and you do that under pressure and um, energy. So, that's a not an option. And then you can ask, okay, will the refinery then try to make pet coke? meaning that they will take out all what is liquid from the fuel and make that distillate. Well, then they will end up with uh, a lot of pet coke, which has a lot of energy in it, and that's an even worse waste because you cannot pump it through a system and use it for energy source for transport. You can then you have to use it on the shore side in power plants, etc. And that is also a waste. So I am aware that there is a drive toward less fuel oil because the demand from the shore side is going down, and maybe from the ship side. But in the foreseeable future, I think there will be sufficient fuel oil. Very good. No, I have. No, for scrubber, no. I have so I will take the point from you. Uh, I have a question also now, speaking about scrubbers. Um, first of all, you have to say that uh, we were happy to see that there is a solution now to, to manage all the exhaust gas pipes in one scrubber. This is something that I did not know that uh, exists. So now you have found a hopefully proven solution to this. My question is, how many sensors uh, will your system use for the exhaust gas of uh, Then we will use one at the outlet of this common scrubber. Uh, we will just forget about the inlet and use one for the outlet. It will be one for the, for the, uh, for the outlet. Yeah. So what do you... will be socks. No. You measure both SOX and CO2 because there is a linear relation between SO2 in ppm dash CO2 in percentage and the equivalent uh, sulfur in the oil. This is described in the EGCS guideline, but it's a linear relation. So what we measure is SO2 in ppm and CO2 in percentage, typically three percent sulfur is 500 ppm uh, sulfur and the CO2 for a two-stroke engine is around five, a little bit below five. And this equation, you can see how this relates to the fuel oil. And then you have to reduce the SO2 in ppm down to around 18 ppm, then you are at around 0.1 percent sulfur. So it is, a, it is a mix for a sensor for CO2 and SOX, for, in one sensor, two sensors. You, you have that as one, uh, let's say, one instrument that measures both at the same time. And in the water effluent side? And then you have to, uh, there are three things mainly you have to be concerned about. It's the pH. Uh, how acidic the water is. It's the PAH, which is another word for, uh, for oil. 
and it's the turbidity. And you need different instruments for these uh, species. Um, as it stands today, the pH level is uh, quite easy to meet in open loop. Uh, so actually, there is no cleaning requirement for oil, basically. That may change as IMO review or uh, these regulations in the time to come. But at the moment, it's very little cleaning requirement. It's first when you go into closed loop that you will see this cleaning requirement, but that is because the water is going in the loop. pH, we are having a regulation saying that it should be measured four meter from the outlet. And there is a dilemma there because to do that with a main engine running, it's uh, impossible because then the ship is moving ahead, of course. So you cannot measure them four meters from the outlet easily. So that's where we have a debate about how to do that in a practical way. If you use caustic solar, you raise that pH up to the required level, and you don't have an issue on the pH. On the turbidity, you can also have turbidity issues if you use only seawater and you take the pH very low. But if you keep the pH up, and you are not overdosing with caustic, then there are no turbidity issues here. And these uh, instruments are marine type? You have experience with this, or it's uh, equipment that have been used in uh, solar yes. installations? And yes, we have experience with pH is no problem, turbidity is no problem, PAH is an issue. PAH monitoring equipment is coming or is developed from in connection with the North Sea or oil industry. They are extremely cost costly. It's using fluorescence to measure and they are at the moment not very stable, trustworthy as I see it. But the manufacturers working on these instruments, and there are a handful of them, are doing progress. So I expect that these will come down in price. I mean, they are equipment costing $100,000 or more, just this equipment. And then there are silver packed, stainless steel, certified for the North Sea, and this has to come down. Okay, thank you. And uh, one last question from my side about this uh, exhaust gas. I suppose you have two or one, because I saw one, but it should be two for redundancy. Exhaust gas, is this the gas you have? The fan? Yeah, well, this is, these two fans are not redundant. They have 1.5 times redundancy. We can make them fully redundant, but we are not required to have that from a class point of view. Uh, we have that, on the other hand, on the water side, the pump side, but not on the fan side. So you have just uh, two fans, but they are not redundant. It's uh, for, no. to cover full capacity, one fan. We have one fan. We have two fans. Two fans. But we are not dimensioning these for 100% redundancy. And that, and they are a constant speed or uh, because how you cope with the changes of load if you have the engine you don't have the engine uh, with the, the change in load or two generators three generators or maybe boiler stop start yeah we can and uh, there are different ways to do it we can either control this by having a link to the machinery that is attached to the system but we don't prefer to do that and we like to avoid it so what we do is that we define operation modes so when the ship is out sailing open sea or in maneuvering we are running the fans and the water at full speed what has happened then is that when we take down the load on the men uh, on the engine then more and more gas is going in recirculation. Now that means the gas is cleaned several times. That means that we are going down on caustic consumption. 
So you, and then we have a surplus of water, so that also takes down the consumption of caustic soda. So it's just when we are coming then into port and we say, okay, now it's only the uh, auxiliary engines that is running and the boiler, for instance, then is a push button and by the frequency drives on the pumps and the fans, we just adjust the system to that uh, required load. And we can define other load setting for the system as required. For instance, we are working on looking at some um, uh, shuttle tankers where the DP mode will be the most demanding. It will be more demanding than the full seagoing mode. So that's kind of setup or configuration of the system. Last, last question, thank you. One last question for you by Mr. Panos Yanoulis. Can you allow the sulfurized gas exhaust to be passed through eventual select, uh, SCR or you need the heat to heat it up for the selective catalytic? Well, yes, I mean, uh, the, the, um, you can put an SCR after the scrubber, but the exhaust going out of the scrubber has very low temperature. If it's a, a seawater scrubber, it's just a few degrees above actually seawater level. If you use less water like we do, we have about 50, 40, 50 degrees of temperature of that exhaust. So to reheat that sufficiently for putting it through an SCR, that's absolutely out of the question. So, I mean, we then applaud both these concepts of MAM and like also Vetsila is working on it, to have high temp SCR between the cylinder and the turbocharger or the EGR system. And I would say that we took out the patent also that if they can make an EGR with a scrubber between the outlet and inlet on the high pressure side, why can't we take the clean exhaust from our scrubber through the compressor and into the uh, uh, inlet in that route? And then you have only one scrubber. And then you have a Columbia. Columbia, not. <laughs> Mr. Yanulis. If you make it to the SCR upstream of the scrub, then you destroy your SCR. Because if you have the gases which are not desulfurized, you destroy your SCR. Well, yes, but I mean, that, that is MAN is better to talk about because, I mean, that is exactly what they are doing when they have the SAR at a very high temperature if, between the turbocharger and the, uh, and the uh, cylinder. Yeah, we are injecting uh, ammonia in the high temperature exhaust gas, uh, sorry, uh, not ammonia, uh, urea. And due to the high temperature, this urea con uh, is uh, uh, turned into ammonia. And then in the SCR reactor, it reacts with the uh, uh, NOx to formate uh, 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 in, uh, nitrogen and water. But we have no scrubber in that area. We are heading for a movable laboratory on board. Uh, um, yes. Uh, question is uh, uh, for the uh, this type of SCR. What type of uh, fuel uh, do you use? I mean, what percentage of fuel is appropriate for this type of SCR? Are we talking about for for SCR application on a two-stroke engine? Yes. Yes. Um, we have experienced the, this uh, vessel Santa Vista that uh, when we have operation with 3.5 uh, percent sulfur in the fuel, then we have actually a, a little problem. Uh, it is uh, trouble-free when we are talking about uh, power plants where they are running on MDO. Then there is no problem. But the sulfur content creates a problem, and uh, uh, I'm not sure what the, the, the 
the answer will be in the future. But there will, uh, as we see it now, there is some clogging uh, in the system due to this uh, the sulfur content, and also to due to an ammonia slip. Uh, all the ammonia ammonia which is uh, created is not used, and then it, it, it bypasses and goes into uh, to the system and uh, assists in this cloning. But uh, we are confident that we will solve this uh, by the service experience that we will gather uh, over the next three years. Thank you. And then uh, from Mr. Yanoulis again of St. King, for Mr. Stelios <coughs> Kiryakou, how effective is your system using UV technology in turbine waters? And how effective is your system using electrochlorination in fresh waters? The answer to that is both are very good. Uh, now, with regards to the issue of UV and the uh, issue of turbidity, turbidity is one of these rather uh, interesting um, characteristics of water that are frequently encountered in coastal waters. What we have to remember that the efficiency of uh, <coughs> filtration itself gives you the ability to remove the particles that mask the organisms. The other items of turbidity that are primarily related to the minute particles of chemicals that are referred to commonly as humic substances it is impossible to deal with. The reason for that is that all these particles are submicron in size and the only way to treat them would be by using membranes, which probably is not a practical solution for the flow rates we are talking about. Therefore, our UV technology is as good as anybody else's. It cannot be any worse. Um, in fact, we are using medium pressure UV and um, a rather interesting configuration, geometric configuration of lamps in order to expose the complete ballast water stream in the, uh, within the reactor. Well, your question with regards to the electrochlorination in fresh water, uh, an interesting one, but the problem does not arise. As I briefly mentioned in my presentation, we are dealing with a slip stream or a side stream chlorination system. The idea behind that is that the store of uh, oceanic or salt water is available on board. That will be part of the prescriptive elements of the ballast water management plan that is required by the convention and the rules. And the crew will have to make the necessary uh, preparations to have the availability of water for the purposes of carrying out the, uh, the treatment in fresh water. Just for um, a little bit of information on the slipstream side of things, we are only using five cubic meters per hour, no more, in all capacities. The other question you haven't asked me, and I'll give you the answer, is the one what happens with cold water because fresh water is one issue, cold water is another. The fact that we have implemented a solution that includes a side strip with five cubic meters an hour enables us to rather interestingly introduce a heat exchanger, scavenge heat from the uh, exhaust, from the cooling systems of the ship, and raise the temperature above the minimum required in order to have an efficient chlorination. Okay, I have a question for uh, Mr. Ali of, uh, uh, regarding silicon paints. Um, have you addressed the problem of algae uh, sticking onto uh, a surface that doesn't use any biocide? You yourself said that if you put a piece of glass at sea in 20 minutes, the, uh, the colors are changing. And I'm aware of uh, the problems MERSC had, at least the first generation of silicon-based paints, where they sunblasted their ships to apply silicon-based paints, and then they found out that they had a problem with algae. They had to uh, clean very, very often the algae, which was easily cleaned, but no port would allow them to do this cleaning. So they sunblasted the ships again, millions of dollars, to go back to conventional paints. So. What is the status now with silicon paints um, uh, and, and this algae problem? Slime release properties are dictated by 
the dry film thickness. The dry film thickness is, from our perspective and our company policy, non-negotiable. We have a DFT where we realise slime release occurs. Below that, you do not get performance. The complexity with the Maersk story is possibly um, contaminated by, uh, shall we describe it as over-optimistic claims on performance. Um, that company needs to defend itself. I'm not here to uh, comment on their behalf. Um, our experience is in relation to slime release, the third generation has, has enhanced slime release properties. Um, in terms of cleaning, we spent two years researching appropriate cleaning methods. Um, we have an approved set of uh, cleaning companies uh, should they, uh, the vessel require cleaning. Uh, it's a mix of um, approved contractors using water, uh, some use brushes, but the brushes are special. Um, one of the factors that I think that influenced the Maersk experience was the coating was damaged microscopically. And that, once that surface is broken, you don't have surface energy effect anymore. Once you lost that performance, the rapidity with which fouling settles increases. And that consequently leads to another cleaning, and the gap in between successive cleanings gradually reduces. And yes, it is relatively easy to, to remove, but it becomes problematic. Now, <clears throat> there's a huge amount of uh, research trying to understand why this happened. Um, I'm a chemist by, uh, by training, uh, so I'm, I'm not here to uh, argue with naval architects and design engineers. Trying to understand uh, hydrodynamic flow on a vessel which is operating at lower speed is a very, very complex matter for chemists. It's a very complex matter for engineers, so it's a very complex matter for chemists. But we're trying to understand that. What we do see from a practical perspective is vessels with, shall we describe it as comparable uh, trading patterns, like LNG, are very successful. Uh, vessels with quite different and demanding trading patterns, like cruise liners, one moment they're a deep sea vessel, next minute they're, they're coastal, they get good results. So, whilst I, I wouldn't be brave enough to stand up and start arguing with this, Mr. Maersk and saying you're wrong, I'm not convinced that the argument is a simplistic answer. I think there's far more complicated factors involved within this that aren't fully appreciated as yet. But you're quite right, slime release is very important. And all I can say to that is we are very happy with our performance. We have not gone down the route of going into a, a debate about dry film thickness. It is, the dry film thickness is what it is, and it's not negotiable. If it's too expensive, or you, you want to negotiate, we walk away. The performance is, is too important. Okay. But, but from your answer also, I conclude that there is no miracle answers. There is no miracle pains. Uh, it's improvements, but we still haven't gotten into a trouble free thing. Simply put, correct, yes. Yeah. The, 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 there are no coatings which are perfect. The, the, these, these coatings as well, and I, I, I stress this again, it's, it's not a simple case of this system applies to all vessels for everybody. It isn't. It's one particular aspect which you can consider to solve a particular problem. There are other technologies that uh, we and other people are researching as well. Um, at this moment in time, um, fouling release, from our perspective, is based on silicone chemistry. Where will it be tomorrow? I don't know. It might still be silicone chemistry. It might be something completely different. But that's the, the way we will take it.
And now two questions for Professor Kitakis. <laughs> the first is from Panos Yanoulis, Ocean King. Is the asset manager management philosophy applied to ships operating? Yeah. What are the result lessons learned? Any references? Yeah. Three in one. <laughs> so first question, is the asset management philosophy applied to ships in operation? Operating. Not in operation, ships operating. Okay. Um, we, we started about uh, two and a half years ago. Um, first with two uh, major operators, uh, one in uh, container ships, one in tankers, and uh, uh, since then we have be, been using this uh, to two other uh, companies, total uh, I would say six or seven ships. Uh, we have been uh, very cautious with the deployment of this thing because uh, we were learning the user's demands as we went along. Uh, I have to say that uh, We'll be using a very powerful tool, uh, which is well validated, but for another purpose, for engine design. And we use it for engine evaluation. We, as if we are using a, a cannon to uh, open doors. Uh, it's a very efficient way to open doors, but they are circular. Uh, so it has to be sort of uh, made to, to uh, respect what the users demand. And, um, the tool in itself is, um, or we were more, let's say, uh, happy or um, used to have uh, applications, uh, even in operation, uh, more fancy than, uh, than that uh, which is being used. Uh, by fancy, I mean, for example, uh, what if there's a fire in the scavenge space and there is surging in the turbocharger and uh, the engine won't stop, this kind of application. But now uh, we are more into uh, is uh, cylinder pressure right, is uh, uh, turbocharger speed right, uh, or more mundane like what is the calculated exact fuel consumption under these conditions of the particular engine, which is apparently a very useful thing. So yes, we are, uh, we're not reach yet uh, the, the level of uh, possibility of, uh, let's say, wide and, and full deploy deployment. Uh, but I think that uh, this will uh, very soon come, uh, where the, the tool will be available for commercial use. Thank you. And then uh, one uh, question from David Klaas, Natalieki, about asset management. Is giving you ideas for new customers. Keeping an eye on the performance of, of an asset will be done by the company asset owner or the manufacturer or someone else. Um, yeah. Well, looking at um, what's done in other industries, all three options are, are possible. Uh, it depends on the uh, on the way that a company operates. Even in our particular cases of, uh, with shipping companies, there, are, there is a case where the, the company wanted the, the tool to be used in-house. This means training and things like that, uh, and uh, specialized stuff. Um, the uh, third-party solution uh, may be a better, I would say, um, proposition for, for many who don't want to be bothered by it. Uh, the engine manufacturer, uh, again, uh, we do have at the moment, um, as, a, as a group, a laboratory, a cooperation with the MN Augsburg, exactly on this subject. Uh, they have expressed interest to use this method and tools, but I'm not using them yet. Um, the, the same thing um, is with uh, Vertila uh, Vaza, fourth look again, uh, on a, a little different level. Um, over there, it's, um, it's a matter of, uh, of using, uh, uh, let's say, modeling for advanced control. And eventually, there will be engines which have uh, self-evaluation features. But this will take some time to, uh, to materialize, I would say, five or six years at least. So 
uh, all three options are possible, I would say. Thank you. Then one comment from Professor Grigoropoulos, who is a member of MATECMA and a member of the ITC com ITTC committee, for the EDI presentation commented by Mr. Sea. Uh, he says that the number of double runs required for the city rise of a new building are six. Two double runs at Kotok speed, two double runs at EEDI speed, and two additional double runs at uh, a sub, uh, uh, horsepower between 65 and 100 percent of MCR. This is a clarification about the number of double runs. And then a question from uh, Professor Khailov Saraftis to Professor Panos Zachariadis. The question is, why does the Greek shipping industry support EDI, even though you know it's deeply flawed and cannot be salvaged by any of the fixes that uh, are being discussed? So we to answer that. Yeah. Well, apparently the question has to do with the Greek involvement at IMO. Uh, we, Greece doesn't really support EDI. We, we know this flawed. It's uh, a realistic uh, recognition that we have to live with it. Whether we support it or not, it passed. We have to live with it, and then our effort is in trying to make it workable and, and to improve it, like many other regulations. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure we really need a ballast water treatment uh, convention. Uh, okay. I, I, I bypass the subject just to say that, that <coughs> shipping will spend $80 billion in the next few years to put ballast treatments on the ships. That doesn't take into account the cost of the ships lying around. More than $100 billion, therefore, will be the cost of shipping for ballast water treatments. And I was wondering, if we put a small fraction of this money aside in a fund, uh, whether, for example, the uh, 250 million that, that it costs every year for the European Union will be taken care of, and all the other problems we might have will be taken care of a lot more cheaper rather than installing uh, factories on board our ships. Uh, so EDI is another regulation which is not warranted. Um, it doesn't really uh, uh, produce the results that it seeks. Um, a relevant question to the classes would be with uh, this minimum power requirement. Because EDI leads to smaller engines, we're going to have problems with underpowered ships, uh, for example. Greece is trying at IMO uh, to have a realistic limit, but shipyards and Ajax, uh, they don't want that. They want a very low uh, minimum power uh, uh, that will be a requirement so that virtually every ship, uh, no matter how small the engine, can comply. And we see, for example, now Panamax bulk is coming out with 7,000 kW MCR. And, and the question is, uh, is that ship going to be safe uh, in bad weather? I, I don't think so. And my bigger question is, how can Ajax actually uh, go uh, and set minimum power requirements that are so low that the ships that will be produced will have the stamp of Ajax that they are safe, whereas I know, as a naval architect, they are not going to be safe. That's, that's a big question, and, and the future will show who's right. Thanks. I think the, the, the discussion that has started recently on the minimum power versus EDI, I think it's a perfect opportunity to see that there's something, uh, that, that there's a big problem, uh, that there is a kind of conflict between the, the EDI requirement and the requirement of the minimum, either minimum power or minimum speed, in the sense that if you want to satisfy the minimum power requirement, you cannot do it unless you are not EDI compliant. So uh, you know, I was wondering whether, I mean, this was not clear before. Uh, so, so I was wondering whether you can take uh, uh, this opportunity and say, well, let's uh, let's let's uh, 
let's not do something that is fundamentally wrong. Not, let's not, not rush into, thing, into things, or, or let's relax, for example, the EDI requirement so that, uh, so that you, you, are not, you don't have a problem with the power. Well, okay, first of all, you, you don't have to have an underpower ship to comply with the EDI. Uh, this is the easy way. Like, like many people said, to reduce, reduce uh, uh, the power, reduce the speed in order to comply. The intention of AEDI was to force the shipyards to design the ships better. In other words, what my presentation said, to produce better hull forms and reduce resistance so that with a lower horsepower you can achieve the same speed and the same result as before. That was the intention. Um, so uh, you can comply with the EDI, uh, but people prefer to comply the easy way, and that, that is where the problem is. Uh, and we, we are far down the line now to say, um, uh, forget about the EDI. And we tried, of course, also the option at IMO that for slow speed ships, bulk carriers and tankers, EDI should be relaxed at least during the first years of implementation where there's a tendency from shipyards to use the existing bad designs and just derate the engine. Uh, but that didn't pass either because actually the shipyards, this is exactly what they want to do. They want to use the existing bad designs with a smaller engine to pass the EDI and not to have to redesign the hard lines. Simple. And one question for, uh, for all. Um, first of all, for, Mr. Psara, for Professor Psaraftis, I, uh, if I am not wrong, there is now an invitation for uh, experts by AMO to, to repeat the exercise of this uh, greenhouse gas study of 2009. This is correct? Yes, it is. And uh, then, uh, just for my information, uh, this group of experts, uh, they are self-nominated. I mean, if I go and say I am the expert, <laughs> more or less, yeah, that's how I am. then I will join the group. <laughs> or is there any? Uh, don't laugh, please, because we must uh, get another spot. Or, or there is any rational uh, way to select the the group of experts to revise the zero to infinity study of 2009. Okay, uh, let me say what I, what I know about this. Uh, there has been a decision by the IMO to uh, update the 2009 greenhouse gas study. Uh, so uh, the question was who would do it? Okay. Who would do it? I asked that question to the secretariat of the IMO, and the, the answer I got is that they, IMO would do it uh, with the assistance of EMSA, uh, and possibly assisted by some external consultants. So uh, to me, it's not really clear uh, either what exactly they are going to do, other than update the data, uh, uh, following the same methodology, or exactly how this will be done. So there is a, there is a kind of nebulous uh, situation in my mind, at least, how, in the sense of how they would do it. Uh, to give you an example, the, 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 I mean, as I, I mentioned in my presentation, the, the, the 2009 study uh, used the, the uh, bottom-up approach, the activity based. Well, they, they assumed a, the worldwide fleet of, of ships. They take a, a standard speed of, for these ships, and based on that speed, they calculate, the, they estimate the consumption. Uh, the, the, the speed input they use is from uh, databases such as uh, Lloyd Register, Fair Play, or whatever. That speed information is very inaccurate, uh, very unreliable. So uh, the same follows for whatever results are, are produced by the, this assumption and the, uh, a million other assumptions that are used in this model. So the question is, are they going to use the same method? Uh, we all know that speed is not constant. Uh, speed depends on market conditions, depends on fuel prices, depends on all, all kinds of other things. 
So it's not clear what method they're going to use. Uh, so if, uh, if the, the method is the same and it's just an update uh, using different flip data or different uh, other data, I think the value will not be you know, very, very significant. There is an opportunity that they, they, uh, they, they develop other models, uh, I don't know, maybe based on fuel sales or whatever that, uh, that are more, uh, more uh, reliable. But uh, if they use the same method, uh, my, my estimate is that it's just not going to be a very good value. There will be a steering committee to oversee the study that will be uh, consisting of, of people from uh, member uh, organizations. But, uh, but so far, uh, things are, in, at least in my mind, not very clear on how they will, uh, what's going to happen. Yeah, he knows more than I do, well, by all means, <laughs> would like to know. Yeah, with reference to these expert groups, um, I do know how the balance side of things works with EMSA. Uh, the manner in which this is uh, sorted out is EMSA themselves do not have the core competencies to deal with all problems. So typically, they will, on their website, they will uh, put a call for experts. Consequently, people that are monitoring these websites are able to identify these calls and you can forward yourself as an expert, representative, etc., etc. So I guess it's probably appropriate for the industry to be more proactive rather than reactive. And then I don't know if there is any representative of uh, Greek flag uh, around. But I would ask, is there uh, any... Hellenic origin expert attending. Professor Psaraltis. I mean, uh, I asked them whether we can be involved. I mean, as, as in TUA, because we are interested. And uh, we can identify at least uh, some uh, potential pitfalls. And the response I got was, uh, well, we're going to use, uh, I mean, uh, we're going to do it with EMSA. I took, it that, I took that, that, that answer as a no. But uh, you mean you have approached the Greek flag who is No, 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 I approached the, secret the IMO secretariat, whether we can be involved. But you are non-governmental uh, organization, no. correct? You're not... Uh, no, but I mean, for example, I mean, IMO routinely use, uses consultants uh, like uh, classification societies, uh, other, uh, other research organizations, so I figured why, why shouldn't I ask whether uh, we can be involved? And uh, with respect to, to who, who are experts in these groups, uh, I recently uh, participated in a group of experts for market-based measures. I mean, they were nominated by, by the Greek administration, uh, which was a group of something like 30, 30 to 40 people. Uh, many, many, of the, many of the people in that group were very knowledgeable, but also I saw some people which had a distinctly political kind of affiliation. Well, for example, there was the ambassador of a, of a country who was based in London, who was a member of that, of that group. And uh, of course, that, uh, that person had a distinctly political orientation in what, uh, the, 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 it was clear that he was there, in, 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 not in a scientific capacity, but in, in a different capacity. So I think there is a danger of having this group of experts uh, Consist of people who are not necessarily experts, but they are they are they have political uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, motivation, and I think this is something to be avoided. Yeah, but then uh, what Mr. Kiaku said is that yes, you have to be proactive, and then maybe you have to contact our flag and uh, and uh, participate, not just uh, checking the outcome, but uh, dictating the outcome. I mean, let, let me tell you a couple of things about IMO. In, in the, when they are preparing to make a study which will make a big impact on whatever is going to happen later, first, first you make a study and then you call the experts to evaluate this study, to take it forward and all that. This is the NBM. The NBM assessment where Professor Psarathis was nominated on behalf of Greece to be in the group of experts that will review the study and will review... That who made the study? Okay, I'll get to the study. 
because that, that's the tricky part, okay? Now, um, uh, who will review the impact of every MBM and finally decide are we going to have an ETS for shipping or are we going to have a levy for shipping or something in between? Those experts are nominated by the, by the uh, member governments and they usually end up in the panel and they usually are not independent experts. They, they, they uh, are actually trying to take care of the interests of their own country and their own industry. Okay, that, that's well known. Now, the, the study based on which those things will be assessed is very crucial. And what he was saying before, in a nice way, was the way IMO selects who's going to make the study is not transparent. It's as simple as that. He, he tried as NTUA to take part in the study and they, tell, and they told him, no, thank you. We already decided who's going to make the study. So I tried to find out what are the criteria that they decide where to give the studies, but I couldn't. It's not transparent. And we had the chairman of IMO. Okay, so this is a, a no answer session. Um, so, continuing, just to seek for an answer. Um, we have noted uh, during the speeches of the keynote speech, Mr. Gratzos and then uh, Mr. Joannos and then so Professor Psarathis also was very vertical uh, on this, that uh, is uh, shipping industry environmental friendly? Yes. So we have a yes statement by all of us, and on the other hand, we have a, a, a plethora, or how we can say, a menace of, of environmental regulation, which is not, uh, does not match. My question is how we can convey the message to the public that we are an environmental friendly industry. Can we do that? I will try, I mean, I'm, uh, I will try to give you an answer. I think uh, shipping does not have a very good PR. Uh, to give you an example, uh, there was this Carbon War Room website that was uh, put together by Mr. Richard Branson, of all people. Uh, you have seen the graph that showed the, 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 the environmental performance of shipping vis-à-vis -vis, uh, aviation in terms of CO2 per ton kilometer. I mean, something like 500 more, uh, times more uh, for airplanes uh, versus ships. Yet, Mr. Branson has targeted shipping as the culprit in uh, you know, uh, global emissions, and he's put together this, this website that uh, has lists uh, all ships according to the EDI and uh, have some criteria that are completely non-transparent. Uh, the question is, do we have something uh, comparable? Do we have a website for aviation, for example? And if you go to, to uh, Lufthansa or SAS or whatever, and you buy a ticket, uh, the next question is, do you want to make your trip carbon neutral? So you pay two euros to make your trip carbon neutral. Now, it's not clear what happens to these two euros. Uh, they, they say that they, they pull this fund and make, uh, you know, uh, new... Uh, wind farms in New Zealand or whatever. I think they have a very good PR. PR. Shipping, uh, I don't think uh, shipping has very good PR. So I think uh, the, 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 the PR, PR should be uh, improved, so, so to speak. I don't know how, but uh, we have to. I would like to make a comment also from my background and from Norway. Uh, it's too big distance between people and what is going on in shipping except for passenger ships and then what you see and the perception of shipping is these rich ship owners that seldom is coming forward and if they come forward it's because of any tax issue things like that so the publicity is so bad and they continue having these bad publicity. Thank you. Yeah, the, the most unfortunate thing would be that because we don't have this, we're going to run after uh, the rating that carbon positive is going to give to our ships, uh, no matter how garbage it may be. Um, thank God so far it hasn't happened. I, we didn't have too many charters coming and asking us what is the rating of our ship. 
uh, thank God so far still they are asking what is the guaranteed speed and consumption of our ship and then compare it with others where that is the right thing to do but um, I, I'm afraid if we don't do something then, then we might have a problem with these uh, right ship rating uh, systems uh, and unfortunately the big problem there is that the index they use even the EDI index is not a reflection of the actual uh, 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 consumption of the ship the ships I described in my presentation that are more than five tons less than the standard design of the shipyard, they have a worse EDI than the standard EDI of the shipyard because of the large engine. So that's the unfortunate reality. Could it be possible for me to just add a comment? There is one part of the <coughs> maritime industry that has got a very good PR and a fantastic track record in terms of environmental credentials uh, projection, and that's the cruise industry. So maybe the merchant marine owes to learn some lessons from the manner in which the cruise companies present themselves. Well, for example, in the case of uh, cruise ships, you must be aware of the, of the fact that the exhaust gas emissions have been um, a subject of debate for them for a number of years. Um, they are still visiting the area of Alaska and they had to, early on, before the rest of the industry had woken up to the facts to use uh, low sulfur fuels in order to achieve this. With regards to the discharge of um, waste waters from the hotel services, they do follow the uh, MARPOL standards for the discharge of treated sewage, but because they're going to Alaska and the Baltic states, they have to uh, put up with rules, parochial rules, that are significantly more um, strict and they use this as part of their overall campaign for marketing about the environmental credentials of the industry. Uh, one of the biggest fears that I know that the, the uh, cruise industry has, it is the observations carried out by WWF on their daily operations and consequently by being proactive in keeping all these groups of individuals well informed they have managed to allay the concerns of the populations in the area uh, of the Mexican Gulf, in, the, in uh, the area of Australia, Australasia regions, as well as Alaska. Because cruises are taking place in regions where they are environmentally extremely sensitive. That's where people want to go. They want to go to nice places. Bright blue sea, wonderful, beautiful people, and nice environment. I have a, a comment and a question for uh, Dr. Kokarakis. Uh, one of the next big problems I see coming up to us, like we didn't have enough, is this uh, gold-based standard, but uh, gold-based standard has two uh, tiers or two sections. One is the good one, as I call it, <laughs> and one is the one based on the risk-based approach. And the one based on the risk-based approach is what he said, the regulation says there should be protection for people not to fall overboard, and that's it. Don't, don't tell them that they have to have a, a one meter uh, 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 protection over there or anything else. I see already a move at IMO that based on the risk-based approach where you make a study, an FSA they call it, where you can prove that something is an equivalent to what is the prescriptive regulation, then you can apply uh, uh, the equivalent according to your study. Uh, that has the potential of throwing the whole SOLAS book out the window, because everybody can have a study and say, this is equivalent to a bulkhead of so many millimeters, and uh, I see that as a very big potential problem. And before you give me your comment, I, I want to give an example of a presentation I was at where one of the things currently that's allowed for alternatives is the life-saving uh, regulation. You can have life-saving alternatives other than lifeboats. So there was a presentation 
in order to prove that the new idea you have is an equivalent or alternative to solas that says you have to have a lifeboat for every person, first you have to find out what is the safety level of the existing regulation. And then you prove that your alternative has an equivalent safety level. So in the presentation they had, okay, in a, in a uh, evacuation scenario, the ship starts to lower the lifeboats. 50% probability is good weather, 50% probability is bad weather. If it is bad weather, the boat will swim. 50% probability is going to hit the side of the ship, 50% probability is not going to hit the side of the ship. If it hits the side of the ship, 50% probability is going to crack, 50% uh, is not going to crack. And all this was now in fine print that I was able to read over there. And finally, if it was going to crack, then all the people in the boat are considered dead. Okay, and, and this is how they got the existing safety level. If the boat cracks, all the people are considered dead. Therefore, we don't have such a safe current arrangement. Therefore, it would be easier for their equivalent to prove a better safety level than the existing regulation. So when I asked, but you say here, if the boat cracks, everybody's dead in the lifeboat? Everybody's wearing life jackets and all that? Surely half the people are going to be saved. The reply was, well, this is our study, this is our assumption. If you don't agree, make your own study, make your own assumption, and, and you know, go to AMO. So that's uh, what we're up against, I think, with this risk-based approach. Dr. Pokarakis, any comments? <laughs> this is a very interesting question. Uh, actually, I don't want to be confused for a supporter of the risk-based design. It is uh, a very old story since the 80s when uh, in the United States there was an effort to introduce structural reliability ideas uh, uh, in ship design. Uh, amongst them was the, the professor at that time, uh, today president of DNV, Hendrik Manson. Uh, but uh, uh, we found that it was very difficult to apply these ideas because of the complexity involved. And like you said, there is an uncertainty in the quantification of risk. You can qualitatively define the risk, qualitatively, but it's very difficult to quantify. And this is the reason in the presentation I mentioned in parallel with the goal-based ideas uh, appeared uh, the risk-based design uh, primarily from uh, northern European countries and it was decided, as you know, being a participant at IMO, it was decided to have in parallel a development. To the best of my knowledge, uh, the starting point is the baseline safety level. So this has not been established yet. And uh, I find it very difficult to establish equivalency in safety. Uh, so there, are, uh, there is work being done, but uh, there is no progress. Actually. There is nothing that has been established. Uh, unfortunately, I can advise you that because of all these problems and because a proper study will take a long time, these countries uh, convinced IMO, and they are already uh, have drafted a resolution that says if you follow these guidelines for the equivalent study, then this will be equivalent to any existing regulation in the book. And we have no idea what these guidelines are going to be. These are guidelines to be developed, but the resolution is going to be there. So uh, this, is, this is where it's moving. And this will be a hot subject of MSC 91, where Greece will try uh, uh, to delay it. Uh, fight. Because the, the proper way is, like you said, first you have to establish the risk level of the existing rules. It's a big, it, it's a big project to, to try to uh, compare risk-based design with prescriptive design, uh, to make sure that you have your risk-based uh, formulations calibrated properly. Of course, uh, inevitably, we know that uh, these ideas, uh, I wouldn't say risk, but probabilistic design, it is not first or new in ship design. 
I mean, we have uh, probabilistic crack propagation, we have uh, probabilistic dam stability, even the fatigue analysis uh, nicely analyzed by our colleague, Mr. Contreras, has ideas of uh, uh, random uh, variables and uh, some inevitably there are uncertainties. So this is the big problem with, uh, we talked about grinding, increasing fatigue lag by X years. If we knew how many parameters are involved, and what uncertainties there are, then practically 17 years are identical to 25, I like to say that. So uh, inevitably some probabilistic ideas will be involved in the design with or without this bay design. So we're a bit uh, run out of time, but just uh, I will put in record the last question that I placed to Mr. Pulavasilis, who is now flying. It was uh, replied, but I would like to pose the question and the uh, reply. And then the question was that class, as we see the presentation of Mr. Pulavasilis as well, this same was implied in uh, Ralph Plum's presentation. Uh, class should take a, a global, this is my words, but uh, okay, I don't remember exactly how it was phrased. Class should take a global and holistic approach in business and therefore adopt practical and compatible rulemaking. And then my question was how this can be accomplished. That was an open question. And then I closed the question. I say, should the uh, involvement of stakeholders, owners in this case, at an early stage of rule making or rule changing or rule implementing help in this case? And if the answer is yes, another closed question. Should, could the technical committees be the vehicle, the vehicle for such approach, uh, global and holistic and proactive? And the answers were yes. I don't know what, uh, if Ralph has a different uh, approach or if my English were not proper and the question was not understood. Yeah, I tried, to, I tried a bit to understand uh, what's behind the questions, I think so. And uh, what, I, what I got from you is uh, uh, what is the functionality the last part of my presentation of, for instance, in this concern of the technical committees of uh, the classification societies. And uh, you know that uh, I, I think you both are maybe also partner or uh, members of uh, these kind of committees in any classes. And what we discuss there, very frankly speaking, is our rules, our rules and guidelines. And uh, I think this is uh, the basis for your ships, finally. And uh, you are really the, the technical committee this is, uh, that I'm the secretary for, uh, for, for environmental matters. Uh, my uh, committee is really working. So we together develop new rules. So help from ship owners. This is a direct relationship at Gavon Troloid, and I think for this, this is also valid for other classes, between stakeholders and classification society. So in that concern, we have very good communication. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, yeah well, yes, Spiros. Thank you. I'd like to ask the following question. I have quite a few, but since time is gone, one of the points that I made, we listened to the presentation that uh, the gentleman from the class societies, uh, each one put on the harmonization and the new rules and the CSR rules and the goal-based standards. Plus, uh, the nice way that Mr. Kokar Dr. Kokarakis went on a step ahead and went into the future uh, getting a risk-based and probabilistic designs and everything. The problem is that we have to see what happens today. Today, we have a new set of rules that passed despite that one major uh, stakeholder, the, the, Greek, the Union of Greek opponents had a lot of objections, were passed and were not implemented correctly. Today, apart from a one project that I know that Mr. Zahariadis was uh, 
supervising. There is no ship that is really built in full compliance with the CSR rules, not a single ship. The entire fore area, the entire after area has not been examined at all. Nobody did the calculations that the rules required. And every time we had some problems, we couldn't find any calculations at all. So first we have to, to sit down and make sure that we do enforce the current calculations and the rules so that all the input we get. Uh, Mr. Poulovacinis was, was talking about the continuous service feedback, which is right. But what feedback if the ship fails because it didn't comply with the rules? What, what do you to get back? So I think this is the first step. And once you put these rules into real operation, we should collect data and then be able to move ahead to the next steps and the probabilities and uh, all these nice risk-based risk things. Thank you. So they are waiting outside, I suppose. If uh, there is no other question, we can close the conference and uh, thank you all our members and friends for their who wants to speak. Okay, please. Uh, of course, the cruise industry. Uh, promotes itself. It's dealing with thousands of people. It's going to places, as was pointed out, in sensitive places. It's mixing with communities all the time. The merchant ship is not. Also, Mr. Branson, of course he owns Virgin Airlines. He's going to chase shipping. Why shouldn't he? I also uh, made a couple of... Anyway, the, the crux of the whole thing is we have to stop hiding. As everyone is continually saying, we have a good story to tell. We should go out and tell it. It's no good going to a, an organization once a year to meet two or three friends, whether it be in US, whether it be in Brussels, two or three friends for a couple of days, you've got to keep on hammering at it. The conception of the people out there is that shipping has something to hide. And until we get rid of this, we're going to be hounded. That's all I have to say. We have to make an effort within the industry. We, we have to get ourselves together. Of course, the cruise companies, there are only a handful of them. After all, there are 20, 30 big cruise companies, so they can easily project themselves. We have to do it ourselves. Perhaps you could take some of these people in your uh, association and go abroad, visit two or three places. Don't go to Emo and sit down with all the other people and fight and argue with them. You've got to go and visit the people who count. Meet the other organizations like your own in different parts of the world. Work together. That it's just simply, we've got to stop hiding. That's all I've got to say. Um, I think, so, are we ready to finish now? Can I say something? Two words that. Um, I can see a relation, a relation to your question with Mr. Focus' question. Uh, perhaps it didn't just by could hear him very well from there. Um, and some t I have touched my presentation on this issue. The fact is, you have started 
as we have said, we should get uh, the, sh the ship built and make it first right. Not so good dipping. When you design the ship, when you assess the ship, when you launch the ship to, uh, to have it right. However, there are some problems in the relation to hiding my insight. Um, when we build the ship, we have three stakeholders. One is the owner, the other is the builder, and the third is the class. Now, class is, con is contracted with the builders. The builders is contracted with um, owners. These three people, otherwise the owner cannot talk to class because he's not an owner yet. Becomes owner after delivery. Now, check. When you check the ship, of course the owner has, in some areas in the world, the right to check their uh, drawings. But the drawings have some calculation behind it. The wood plan approval, as I explained to you earlier on, is not only the piece of drawing, because piece of drawing means little or very and nothing unless you have the calculations, or unless you're doing your carry on calculations, which you can't do that in the span of in 15 days, with, as the contract say, that a turnaround of approval drawings 15 or 25 days, whatever it is. So, what happens is, although the rule says that the class has to carry the calculations, and also the designer has to make the calculations for his design, substantially design, what happens is you have one set of calculations, the designer's calculations. You go to the CPA, to, to, to class, and say, excuse me, I can't do, tell you nothing, I can't give you nothing, because there's prepared information between the designer and class. So the time passes, the ship delivers, something happens, you have good calculations. The owner, I cannot say, is blind. So, transparency, you touch the word transparency. Well, yes, you don't. The way what the industry works at the moment, and the legal sort of issue of how it, it's written down, they have three entities which not in the inception of the ship. When you build, design a ship, build a ship, approve a ship, they don't talk to each other. They can talk to each other, all three of them. You can talk uh, one way and the other way, but not all three of them together on the contractual basis. That's the contract. So uh, you pick up the ship, something happens, the first stresses it, you pick up that, uh, you try to find the calculation, there are no calculations. And that is fact, gentlemen. It is not a fiction. It happens every day. So something somewhere has to be changed. So, thank you. This is what I have to, to transfer you to Mr. Fogart. Am I right, uh, Spiro? I was thinking more of the wider implications of the industry rather than the technical side. EMA, the IPOs have exposed shipping to the public sector. Now people are going to the stock exchange. A wider uh, public is aware of shipping. But we only hear about the 40, 50 companies that are listed on the stock exchange. And at the moment, all the news we hear is bad. We've got to get together as a wider industry, and I think it's associations like Martecma that can do this. You have to go outside EMO and the various official organizations. You've got to do it between yourselves. And of course, it costs some money. Thank you. We will uh, take on board your... Mr. Chairman, just one last one. We will moment. finish. A very quick one. Um, I hope that you are all aware that within Europe there is a European Maritime Day that's organized every year. I have never seen Greece competing to take that day on. Maybe it's time for the maritime industry in this country to uh, be proud of 
is here retention what it does, which it is, and take it forward to show to the rest of the world what you are made of as an industry. Years ago, Greece did host this function when Mr. Metropolis first uh, was elected Secretary General of EMA. So, is it time to close or no? Uh, no, <laughs> not, no more questions. So. I don't believe that he was meant in what he was saying. Class societies do not do the calculations a builder is obliged to do. Class societies verify their calculations. And it's up, up to individual societies to do that. I'm not aware of any similar issues. And if Mr. Contraros has got evidence that class societies are not verifying the calculations, this should be presented and investigated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. I didn't say the word verified. I said they do not carry their own calculations as CSR states. So now, we discuss now, with, uh, they're taking the calculations from the shipyards and they are, as the the dream, pay, the dream. Uh, do their own calculations. Oh, they're not doing it. That's, that's the verification. Mr. Bostrado, you are uh, Ono Mike Bram. <laughs> As, as far as the so, CSR rules for my Mr. Mamalakis, please. Okay, yeah. you can discuss in private. Yes, that would Thank be you. very nice. Thank you. So, uh, in concluding, many thanks to our members and uh, our friends who participated, contributed, and who managed ships under these difficult circumstances. Uh, many thanks to Mrs. Vasilaki, Mrs. Bakula, Samantha and uh, David Klaas who have uh, organized again this event very well. The only change next time would be that questions and answers will be number one session. <laughs> um, our next meeting will be 17th of uh, January for Martecma members and about uh, this event it will be maybe <coughs> next year somewhere in the middle. So thank you. We will have a continuation outside over the drink. Mr. Romalex and Mr. Kondaros have very interesting uh, topics to discuss. Thank you.